Okay. Um, so yeah, very warm welcome to everybody and a special welcome to Rachel Locke from uh, our uh, wonderful Manchester Environmental Education Network and also um, student uh, and uh, I'm sure honorary lots of things, Rachel, in Manchester Institute of Education. Um, it's really lovely to see you here today and I'm going to hand, hand over shortly to you. I just want to encourage people to participate fully in this, I'm sure you will, uh, and also to put comments in the chat as we go along where that's helpful. Uh, that's always a good a good way of participating beyond the the actual spoken word. So, okay, over to you. Hello. Thank you, Andy. Um, very kind introduction there. Um, I'd just like to ask people if they've got anything old fashioned like a pen and a piece of paper that you might just kind of grab because um, I don't know about you, but every time I see Kevin Anderson speak, I always get a kind of panic attack. <laughs> um, what he says, I think, is um, totally on the nail, uh, but also uh, I always find it um, a little bit stressful because he always points to the gaps. So I thought that perhaps we could start off by just drawing a little picture of uh, how you feel post Kevin's talk uh, in relation to our, you know, our human relations with the environment. Uh, just some little picture. And I'll give you just a moment to do that. I think I'll do my own little picture, how I feel. And then maybe once you've drawn your little picture, if you just want to hold it up and share. That's how I feel, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah, big question mark from Andy there. Um, we've got Oh, we've got some rather sad looking faces. What have we got there? Oh, Ryan's got steam coming out of his ears. Yeah. Is it impatience? <laughs> Anyone else want to share their little picture? Humans are the problem. Ooh. Yeah, we're certainly uh, leaving a lot to be desired. Anyone else want to share? It doesn't have to be great art, clearly. <laughs> I think it's just a way of trying to acknowledge our feelings. What do we have from Hannah? We've got, oh my goodness, yeah, I think she's got things all, all around. Yeah, anybody else? Is that it? Right, I'd now like to just get you to think for a moment about an engagement that you have had either as a teacher or um, as parent or sibling or um, something that has warmed your heart. And I particularly want to point you in the direction of how young people are working with climate change. Just try and think about something that you've experienced or come across or seen posted on Facebook or whatever that's made you feel hopeful. That's made you think that young people you know, are responding, getting the message, or that you're getting the message, something that you've done. And what I'd like you to do is actually um, unmute yourselves. And we can see your names, because obviously they're already up. But it would be really nice if you could just in just a few words, just share something that you found uplifting. Would anyone? Yeah, Hannah. Yeah, I mean, just unmute. I'm quite happy for people to just muck in. Hannah. I, 
I observed my niece being utterly the most caring person just for for little things in nature and that is the key I think caring and noticing thank you anyone else we need to get a smile put on our faces again yes Andrea hi I teach at Edvard Moss Community School in Manchester but last year oh God, not last year the year before now we took the entire school on a protest march 2,000 children but the most vocal were the reception class who shouted, save the polar bear for the entire 25 minute walk. I didn't think they'd be able to walk it, let alone, but at the end, we're still shouting, save the polar bears at the top of their voices. So it was very, very promising. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Jenna. Hi folks. Yeah, so I think um, the Fridays for Futures uh, or Futures for Fridays, <laughs> whichever way around it is. Um, yeah, it's been really kind of inspiring to sort of, to, to kind of accidentally sort of jump into some of those um, kind of protests or groups or gatherings and, and those sessions. And just young people's sort of determination towards change, actually, even if they don't necessarily know quite how to get there or what the solution should be and so on, there's a kind of underlying um, real sort of activist passion which is really great to feel, actually. Mm. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, Rachel. I think seeing some of my um, friends um, buy their kids a lot of the um, children's books, I think Waterstones had a, a really good section on environmentalism and inequality and injustice. Um, and as a result, just seeing them in sort of storybooks now, it's just a nice light way to positively make change with kids. Thank you, that's brilliant. Uh, Carol, uh, Carol, yeah. Rachel, um, I'm just thinking back to a time when my friend sent me a picture um, from Halloween last year of her little girl who dressed up as um, the world. Um, apparently at school they were told to bring to just for something that reminds you of a nightmare. It's a bit questionable. I don't know why they did that in the primary school, but she went as the world. Apparently she got laughed at all day, um, but stood really firm and told people and told the children in her class that she was scared because of climate change um, and actually apparently the teacher reported to my friend her mum that a lot of the kids were asking questions all day and they had conversations about it so just from this one eight-year-old who is conscious and aware um, started off the day being laughed at it was just quite an endearing story really that she stuck to her guns and actually taught some of her classmates a few things. Mm, thank you. Anyone else like to share? Um, I will. Um, my siblings are in primary school and they actually get to take part in forest education as well as the classroom education. And I just see their faces when they know they're going to forest school the next day and they get all their stuff ready. And they, they really connect it to nature a bit more rather than just exploring the classroom. Brilliant, thank you. Any Anyone else? Okay, I oh, Ryan, yes, please. I just wanted to second the climate strikes. Yeah, um, go, uh, attending them and, and seeing such impassioned young people is really, <laughs> it warms the heart. It, and to see that they fully embrace the feelings and, and emotions that, of this reality is, I think that's so important. And, and, and that they, they are impassioned to, I don't know, rebel is, is really amazing for me yeah yeah thank you anyone else really happy to take some more okay um i think one of the sad things for me today is the fact that it on a normal mean occasion if we were to run an event we would have young people probably leading the event. We would have young people sharing their stories. Um, and I'm actually quite sad that I haven't managed to get any school children engaging with us today. Uh, Abraham, uh, not Abraham Moss, sorry. Um, St. Peter's were very close to giving us a film that I could share with you. Um, but unfortunately, because they weren't going back into school, we had to uh, change plans. So really what I thought I would do is try and um, fulfill my brief through participatory storytelling. So it's to do with us sharing our stories, 
as well as learning a little bit about um, eco schools. But before I do that, I just want to say what, what means work is, because uh, many of you probably won't have heard of the Manchester Environmental Education Network. I'm sure some of you have, which is great. Um, but our um, reason for existence was to try and network teachers together and provide uh, schools with support on the environmental agenda. Um, we were set up and given finance to do that originally, um, but austerity meant that all that funding was withdrawn. And the kinds of work that me now does is project work with young people. Um, that's not to say that we don't run networks, <laughs> because we do. We run uh, an eco schools network. Um, for uh, eco-coordinators in schools, more of which we'll talk about in a minute. And we also try and bring together um, exciting projects with an environmental focus uh, so that people can learn about new ideas, um, whether that's educational or um, stuff like rewilding, you know, we, we've held a, a, a meeting on rewilding and what that might look like. Um, so we'll take different themes and try and network people who are in schools with external organisations. So one example, another example would be uh, we uh, held a meeting on Zero Carbon Britain. Uh, which was led by the Centre for Alternative Technology. And that brought the dialogue of zero carbon into Greater Manchester. So it was actually um, an important thing to try and do. With our, our projects within schools, we, uh, for those of you who are in MIE, uh, we tend to focus on a lot on peer learning, on intergenerational learning, uh, inquiry learning, communications learning, place-based learning, experiential learning, and, and many different kinds of ways of working with people uh, as possible. But one of the things that uh, we do work a lot with is the Eco Schools program. I'd be really interested to know who here has come across the Eco Schools program. Would anyone, any sort of thumbs up or, um, yeah, obviously a few people. There's uh, quite a lot of people on who I'm not quite sure. I can't see uh, where we're up to. Hey, there's someone else. No, Natasha doesn't know. That's great. Thank you. Um, because I want to just focus a little bit on the Eco Schools programme as a means for taking up this agenda in your schools. Um, so what I want to say is that I think Eco Schools is a fantastic vehicle for schools to engage with environmental issues. Um, but it also has its limitations. And I think when you're faced with something like Kevin's talk this morning, and you're looking for ways to try and move um, our communities towards being zero carbon, we need to address some of those gaps that exist between um, what children uh, can be asked to do in schools, what they're capable of doing, um, but also how we need to help them achieve their goals. Um, and I think that follows through on, a on, on the chat line that was going on with um, Kevin's talk where we were talking about, you know, school leaders needing to be not just young people, but also the adults in the school. Um, so what I'm going to do is just going to share my screen with you to give you a, an idea of what Eco Schools does. So Eco Schools, it's an international program. And the idea is that you sign up 
your school to the program and you follow what looks a lot like an action research project basically where you go through a cycle of setting up an eco committee that eco committee um, in a lot of schools uh, that will involve um, pupils from every year group um, having said that though many schools will set you know every school will have its own specific way of setting up its eco committee uh, the first task is that you do an environmental review and that's really to make an assessment of what your school is doing there are different review processes online um, so for example uh, a high school will do a different review from a primary school um, and it's very much up to the eco coordinator, the teacher who, or the teaching assistant or the cook or whoever it is that is leading that eco committee uh, to make sure that that review is done um, in as much depth as can be achieved by those participating. You then draw up an action plan and decide what areas you want to work on um, and then make sure that there are links into the curriculum and that is often quite uh, a difficult task if you're a teacher in a high school say in physics you might be able to say yes i can make those links to the curriculum that's fairly straightforward but at, to actually get um, curriculum links across a whole school can be quite tricky the next um, part of the cycle is to inform and involve. And one of the issues that always comes up is how to communicate what the Eco Committee are doing and to try and make sure that input comes from the whole school back to the committee. And different schools will have different ways of doing that as well. Uh, it's also very good to involve uh, other adults in the school in that committee. So it may be that there's a school governor involved or parent or uh, the administrator, whoever is willing really to, to join up. Then you have the whole process of monitoring and evaluating what is being done. So a process of reflection to actually consider what has been achieved. Uh, and then, the eco committee are also tasked with creating an eco code, which is just a way of describing really um, the goals, the aims and the achievements of the eco committee in a way that the rest of the school can understand. So, sorry, I should have put that on slide really. So, these are the topics that eco schools cover. When I first started working with eco schools uh, rather a long time ago, uh, there weren't quite as many and, and they have been adding to the process as I suppose our understanding of the agenda has uh, increased. So there is bi biodiversity, water, energy, school grounds, waste, litter, marine, that's a, a relatively new one. And, and that's a strange response. I think it's mainly their response to the plastic crisis, really. Global citizenship, healthy living and transport. And as you can see on the notes, I've sort of mentioned the fact that um, the eco team need to pick a certain number of these to work towards uh, three awards. So there's the bronze award, the silver award, and the green flag award. And schools have to reapply. So once you get your green flag, it's not just a question of having achieved that. Uh, you then have to uh, reapply uh, over and over again. So um, there's the eco schools um, 
website. And what MEAN tries to do is obviously help um, teachers share their stories about um, their work with eco schools, but also we work on projects that will help um, eco teams achieve those goals. So for example, we will have a project called Save Our Soils or a project on climate change or uh, our Wangaro Matai uh, social action project. And all those different projects will help schools uh, move towards that award. So I'm just going to stop sharing so we can all come back together. Um, does anyone have any questions about eco schools? Yes. Um, yeah, Jenna. Yeah, cheers. Thanks for that, Rachel. Um, from in, you know, via uh, Mean, is there a sort of a really clear list of schools that are are kind of part of the eco schools program or on the other flip side the kind of gap if you like in terms of which schools are are, are not yet <laughs> which yeah, i know it's, it's not <laughs> it, it's something that i would i would actually call a controversial subject <laughs> um eco schools used to regularly update um the city council with a list of all the schools that were signed up um, but if you start to approach schools, some of them will be working on it and some of them will have parked it on the back burner. Uh, some of them won't have touched it for 10 years and they're still on the list. Um, so really, it, for me, it's very much about, you know, who's out there, what they're doing and how to how to work with them. There is no definitive list. We have tried to, to do that, but it's always such a changing landscape. It's quite hard to, um, to achieve that. But if you went direct to eco schools, they might be able to tell you something about what's happening um, in terms of their list. There is a list. Oh, that's useful. Yeah. Who else had a question? Anyone else? I think Stefan did. You're muted. Yeah, Stefan. yeah I was just going to ask uh, if you had any, any more examples of the sort of criteria that the eco schools would need to fulfil to get their different levels. I guess I could just look at the website to see. Yeah, that. you could. I mean, it, to, to be honest, the bronze is really straightforward. You set up your eco team, you have a couple of meetings, uh, you do the review, I think. Um, and then you just apply, but you, you apply um, when you're ready and you're the only person judging when you're ready. Okay. So really, I think um, that that's one of the things about um, eco schools is it, the, the oversight is very much down to you. When you get to green flag though, you will have a, a volunteer come and visit who will do a walk around assessment of the, of the school and check out what's been achieved. Um, mm -hmm. I have to say, I don't think I've ever come across any school that hasn't Pasta. been awarded, which yeah. is interesting. Um, but these are the stories that are kind of of interest to me. It's a bit like, you know, how do we judge what an eco school is. And I think it, it's very good because it's very much people led. It's about people participation. Um, but what would happen if, if the uh, person making the award went to talk to the head teacher? You know, would the head teacher be aware of everything that they've done? You know, that would be interesting to find out, especially in, you know, high schools where, um, uh, eco schools is often seen as something that somebody else does, somebody over here. Uh, I mean, I can think of examples. Um, I, I would name the school, but I won't. Um, <laughs> where the eco team had done a fantastic assessment of why the school should recycle uh, more, than, more than just paper. And they worked out how much the school would save if they did this. And they, they did a fantastic presentation, which they took to the head 
And the head at the time said, basically, no. In fact, that head at the time was a climate skeptic. For me, that it raises all sorts of issues. And these are the kinds of stories that I think we need to discuss um, if you were to think about setting up eco schools in your school or if you're working with an eco school. Um, how do we actually help young people um, move towards making change? And I think that if you've got a situation where a head teacher will actually turn around and say, well, you know, no, I don't think I will take your advice. I don't actually think that climate change is happening. Um, what does that do to the young people? You know, we're putting them in that situation. Uh, how do we actually kind of ensure that they are enabled, if you see what I mean? And I think that um, one of the issues for me with eco schools is that you might have to devise a project, but then you have to think through how that project might evolve and what I was hoping to do in our little session was actually to try and um, get us thinking about projects that could work in school so using the list of different themes actually each of us picking a theme thinking about what that issue might be in a school so perhaps I can just ask you individually to just think of a theme. Do you remember those 10 themes? We had energy, water, biodiversity, school grounds. Was there one in particular that stood out to you? Just have a think about that. Choose a topic. So Andy's picked energy. Anyone want to pick? Another, if you could just write in the chat your topic when you've picked. So there is um, global citizenship. Yeah, I'll share my screen again on those topics. Sorry if I can get there some reason if I go back there we go water energy school grounds waste litter marine global citizenship healthy living and transport so just pick one of those when you've got your topic do a little imaginative storytelling in your own head about the issues that might come up in a school scenario. So if we take Andy, Andy's focusing on energy. So what kind of issues are likely to emerge in a school setting in relation to energy? Are you asking me? <laughs> well, no, it's, I'm just asking people to think that through. Uh, I, so it might be... Uh, heating and... Um, and windows open and uh, yeah. and things like that. Okay. So has everybody picked a topic? Just can you give me a thumbs up if you've got a topic? Yeah, we've got Joanne saying she's doing school grounds. Yeah, Carol's got one. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. So you've got your topic. Now I'd like you to imagine what you think those young people might want to do in order to address that topic so for example if we take energy i can give an example of st peter's where the pupils were really really keen to try and cut the um the energy use across the school so what they did is they set up uh what they called lunchtime patrols and they would cover the whole school and they had a sheet and they marked down who'd left the lights on, who'd left the computers on, who'd left the windows open, and they had a, a check sheet. And every lunchtime they went round and got a record, gathered all this amazing data. 
uh, and they found out, you know, who, who the worst offenders were, okay? So imagine that whatever your topic is, that you've got this theme happening, the kids are going to start working on it. And then I want, perhaps if we can just share briefly our, the topic that you've picked and what you think the issue, the key issue is. Is everyone happy just to go around? And Andy, do you want to just get the ball rolling? Uh, yeah, okay, so um, I'm imagining um, energy Actually, I'm thinking about energy as a very invisible thing, and I'm wondering whether uh, uh, pupils might get start getting together ways of making energy more visible, and they might start putting arrows next to the windows uh, showing where energy is going. Uh, they might have kind of energy flags in different places around the school to get people thinking a bit more about it and recognise what's actually happening in front of them. Lovely. Okay, that's a really nice example of you know this is the kind of action that the pupils might take. Who's next? Who'd like to share? Natasha's got one. Um, so yes, I think someone else. Natasha. I think someone else also picked transport. So sorry, but um, okay. There are quite a few things like that seem obvious to me related to transport, like how students travel to school, um, and also I've seen schools taking action on uh, idling outside of schools as well. So people mm -hmm. sitting with their engines on, um, and I thought maybe a nice thing for them to do would be rather than individually shaming people on how they travel to school, like as a whole class, you could note how, like the, perhaps the carbon footprint of the whole class is traveling to school. And then the whole class could see who could make the biggest improvement. Um, and it could be kind of like a school-wide challenge um, to address something like that. That's nice. Uh, one of the stories that I'll just share with you, um, and you know, if there are stories that you want to share, do that as well. Um, uh, there's a school in Thameside where um, their eco team were allowed to be PCSOs. So they became the police patrolling up and down outside the school. And they actually created these special uh, parking tickets, which they would leave on school uh, on cars parked right outside the school so it might be someone else's parents and they'd leave a ticket you know and, and wag their finger at them and they'd open it up and it would say something like oh you know you really shouldn't be parking here <laughs> or have you thought about air pollution and the effect it's having on your children's lungs and they put these sort of personal messages in what looked like um these parking tickets which i thought is a very good idea Okay, who else? Anyone else want to share their subject? Yes, Carol. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I, <coughs> sorry. I chose um, global citizenship purely because I think one of the issues that we need to consider, I, I'm just thinking from, from my perspective, I'm, I'm from Wigan within Greater Manchester, so, We've got quite a high proportion of um, people living at disadvantage, whether it's poverty, whether it's f in fuel poverty, any other kind of equality. Um, and I think we need to consider climate justice as a social justice issue within this and how it links into many other inequalities and how for schools and, and school children, it isn't, we're not the, you know, although there is a lot of activism around it, we're still not thinking altruistically about the environment, are we? And I think an issue is is understanding how we are connected to the wider world and more specifically how um you know how many privileges we have living in a western society and understanding how you know our carbon footprint is in some circumstances 10 times higher than those in less developed countries so i think a, a good task would be for individual students to look at their own carbon footprint and apply that to um an understanding of how less developing and develop uh, and, and developing countries have so much more of a lower carbon footprint and understand why that is with regards to things like such as our consumption um, and and the sustainability around that then you know is how many times you want to click buy it now on amazon that actually equates to carbon emissions in a country that's less developed and less advantage 
is disadvantaged in comparison to us. Um, just to get that more of a, an understanding that we are global citizens, really. Um, so I think it's quite a, a difficult one to target, but that may be a starting point is getting individuals to look at their own carbon footprint and understand that there is embedded carbon that, that takes place in other countries. Another little story that I'd like to share at this point uh, is that working with a lot of very um, of schools in, in areas where there's a lot of poverty, um, one of the eco teams that I was working with decided that they wanted to do the eco footprint of the head teacher in an assembly. This was fascinating to the kids. And it was also fascinating for the head teacher. They agreed to do it and they did it live. And I absolutely think it was very brave of them to do it. Uh, but it was also quite shocking in terms of the level of inequality between um, the school leaders and um, the families that they were teaching. And I think that there was, it's not just about that global agenda, it's also about that very, very personal agenda. You know, when you had the head teacher saying, well, I flew here and I flew there and I flew there, and the kids are kind of going, wow, that's a lot of flying, miss. Um, and to do that in, a, in an open floor situation, I thought it was very brave. And I think it gave them a bit of a wake up call as well. So actually addressing those issues can be done in, in very different, different ways. Um, I, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, who else? Yes, Jenna. Hey, cheers, yeah, so it kind of follows on, I suppose, from this, uh, yeah, the kind of focus around sort of poverty and, and uh, other social justice stuff. So um, this is actually a project that's kind of been running since 2017, if that's okay, just to kind of give a little bit of an insight into this project. Um, it's around biodiversity. So it's an arts led project based in the Peak District. Um, and I'm not the lead artist on it, but I've been acting as, a, as an advisor and an evaluator. Um, and so the real issue, actually, you know, there's, there's a lot of, <laughs> Um, misconceptions about young people's connection with nature in more rural areas and actually there's a lot of rural poverty obviously as, as, as I'm sure lots of people understand um, so actually the main issue are about the the young people certain young people from low-income backgrounds being really disconnected from land and from nature um, even though they're, they're kind of in a peak district context they don't really actually have any opportunity to connect with any form of biodiversity um, so yeah, so kind of two things coming together here that they were sort of in a rural context and it was assumed that they could have access to nature and they couldn't. Um, and because they're from low income backgrounds, there, there were very few opportunities for them to actually physically be able to get into certain spaces and connect. Um, the other challenge that was acknowledged was uh, the children's fear of insects. So when they're actually talking about biodiversity, they actually were really afraid of stuff. Um, within the school, there was a disconnect between the arts and sciences. Um, and actually, there, there was at the time an, an underused school garden that was supposed to be for the, uh, for the SEN children within the school. And so that was seen as an opportunity, actually, for, for thinking about, well, how can this be used as a sort of hub, as a space that all the children could kind of connect into? So, um, so how this project works and or has been working since 2017 is it started where the artist was an artist in residence for a year. Um, working sort of in parallel with the curriculum and working with the teachers across arts and sciences um, to kind of explore these issues of biodiversity and specifically insects <laughs> um, through, through making and clay workshops and ceramics and so on. Um, and that project has basically sort of um, enabled the artist to become very embedded within the school, to become very close to the teachers, to work with the teachers, to think about those curriculum crossovers. Um, and absolutely, you know, you can see the change within the students in terms of their connection and interest and and their reducing fear in terms of thinking about insects and biodiversity and creepy crawlies and, and so on um, so yes that's kind of an example of, of, of a project that that has been working but again it's been a sort of slow burn over over a few years so great thank you Jenna I mean mean we have a lot of experience of working with fear of soils you know getting muddy yeah. is, is has been a huge barrier um, but that idea of fear of insects, Kevin in his talk 
mentioned about you know the more than human world and trying to sort of make those connections and actually you know I can spend quite a lot of my time in projects when they're outdoors just getting kids to not be afraid of spiders or worms or whatever it is and actually that kind of level of um, attention to those details in the projects is really important because you can actually address um, young people's and adults fears quite frankly you know sometimes um, you know I remember being with the teacher we were going to plant a forest garden on their school field and we walked out to have a look at the plot and she had these tiny little shoes on and she said oh I can't walk on on the grass I can't possibly walk on the grass I'll get my shoes dirty and I was just thinking oh this is going to be an interesting project. <laughs> By the end of it, she had wellies, you know, and actually this is, this is, I think, part of the problem. The stories that we tell ourselves are as important as the stories that we tell each other. You know, how, how we overcome our own issues is as important as how we help other people overcome theirs. So we don't have, we only have an hour um, which is fast coming to a close uh, and I really wanted to talk about the kinds of blocks that we might meet. We've got 15 minutes left Rachel. Yes, we have. Yeah yeah. So what I was thinking was we've got some examples of um, uh, subjects that we're looking at. We're looking at energy, we're looking at transport, global citizenship and biodiversity. If we just stick with those and think about the examples that we've been given and then think about what would help those projects, what would help those young people to make change happen and what would block it. So for example, um, I'll just talk a little bit about the Save Our Soils project, where the young people were very, they were actually very afraid of insects, some of them, um, but we found out that pesticides were being sprayed in the school grounds, and the children did some research around pesticides, and they decided that this was probably not a good idea to go spraying pesticides, well it was herbicide, it was um, uh, Monsanto's uh, delightful um, killer, uh, but it was being sprayed in their forest school area. So they decided to run a campaign. And the block that they hit was how to actually stop the people who were coming into the school ground spraying this stuff from doing it. And obviously they, they went to the head teacher who then gave responsibility. They gave a presentation to the head and the head went, oh yes, this is terrible. Their responsibility was then handed to the administrator. And then what happens next? And then there's a very long gap, okay? What is that telling the young people in terms of engagement? And for me, that was a block. And it's, a, it's something that has flagged up an issue that needs to be addressed. Because those young people, you know, they might put posters around the school, but have they actually affected change? So, yeah, power inequality is a huge issue. And I think any eco uh, team needs to address that because there's nothing worse than the big deflation when nothing changes. So would anyone like to talk about their project and think about a block that might occur? and how there might be an opportunity to um, overcome that. Sorry, I'm not following the chat properly. I'm busy talking. I'm sure there are ideas in there. Who would like to share? Yeah, Hannah. Sorry, I was um, just thinking, and I can't remember who talked about the global citizenship example. Um, I was just thinking kind of, an instant block is that these things, and this is across the board, these things are all quite distant and um, it's hard to kind of grapple <clears throat> with impacts that don't happen right on your doorstep necessarily or at a time in which you feel is immediate. And that's quite a considerable block across the board really. Um, and ways to overcome that would be to bring these things to life by maybe connecting up with people who are living the experience um, 
rather than kind of them being faceless people who we may feel sorry for, but mm, not near enough to make a difference, but actually to have real conversations with people who are feeling these impacts. Um, whether that is far away or maybe even people in our local communities who've had to leave areas because of all the associated impacts of climate change on, um, yeah. So yeah, that's my... That really reminds me, I'm going to tell another little story, uh, and that was um, a group of uh, young people from uh, schools in Bolton were, were linked up with a fair trade school in Ghana, and they got talking, and what they just, they, they couldn't understand, first of all, why these children in Ghana were speaking such brilliant English, I thought that was really interesting, because the whole conversation was in English, um, they couldn't uh, understand why these young people were having to go and work in the cocoa fields before school and the fact that the profit made from their work had actually built their school and the kids were excited to be in school whereas all the kids in Bolton were going well we're just glad to have a day out oh and we've been given chocolate and then there was this revelation that was really astonishing and it was the fact that the children in Ghana who were harvest, growing and harvesting the cocoa that went in these kids' chocolate bars had never tasted chocolate. So they were out there producing, but they'd never tasted chocolate. And that was just, to the kids in Bolton, astonishing. Yeah, Jenna. Yeah, that's a really interesting example, Rachel. Can I just ask though, after that, what happens with that guilt that's generated with those young people? Was it guilt though? Or was it that sense of privilege? Yeah, no, it's, it's just interesting. What, what, what's the, it's the, I'm just really interested in what's the after, like, because you, you have that revelation and then what's, where does that move or how do we move that? What, what's the next stage along from that? I think the issue, I mean, this is one of the shortcomings of running a network. You set up these scenarios and you don't necessarily get the follow-up story. Uh, and what happened will have been that the eco coordinators that brought the kids along will have hopefully addressed the issue, but again, they might not. Um, so I can't actually tell you. Um, yes, Hannah. Can I just add to that? I think that's such an important point because quite a lot of these things, you kind of, a lot of it is about the realization or revelation and uh, that comes out of the learning but actually it's scaffolding that within a caring and supportive framework so that you aren't then just as Jenna implied, laden with guilt and feeling horrific because actually, you know, and actually I think again, that's why the, the kind of really disciplinary approach to learning totally falls flat on its face because it's always gonna be about being a person whatever if you're, if you're doing science and you realize that you know there's there's the the challenge of the system in creating that kind of supportive um environment to be able to sort of turn maybe guilt into rage and uh, outrage and kind of unfairness to then act rather than it becoming a kind of downward spiral because there's there's definitely something to be said about feeling angry about stuff and that's okay. kind of how the the strikes have come about it's that kind of outrage that drives that kind of protest but there's also the assumption that the kids here would feel guilt but actually what i'd put to you is the fact that those kids were, were astonished that the Ghanaian kids were so excited to have been in school so the joy that came from the kids in ghana yeah having the school kind of was was you know, mind blowing. It, it, so, you know, our assumptions that we are better off because we've tasted chocolate might not necessarily hold true because in that instance, the kids in Ghana were so empowered by their school experience um, that actually, you know, it, it, it wasn't as straightforward, I think, as guilt and... Um, <sighs> You know that idea that the, the, the privileged people um, should feel guilt. It, it, it brought up a huge array of different emotions. Mm -hmm. I do think that addressing our emotions is critical. 
you know, I really think that for adults and young people, it, it's really important to get feedback and follow through. I know another a, a story that Lydia um, will tell is after the Greater Manchester um, Conference, uh, when kids were very involved in the whole process, there was very little follow up in schools. So that these kids went along, they had a big day out, they go back to school, nothing. And so Lydia went out and tried to sort of find out, you know, what follow up has happened. And I think that is one of the problems, especially when you're an external educator, is how to build those relationships and build that continuity. Um, but then when you're in school, there are so many different pressures. How do you as a teacher manage to keep that continuity going? And the other thing with eco teams is they, they often change year on year. So different pupils are involved. So you get that lack of continuity as well. Um, but then again, you want lots of people to be involved. So you have that as a, a problem too, you know, how do you get everyone engaged? That is a subject that we're going to um, look at at our next training session uh, for eco coordinators. You know, how, how do you get more than just the eco coordinator banging the drum? Um, big issue. Anyway, would anyone else like to take their subject and just talk through? Um, Blocks and opportunities. Ryan's navigating. Uh, yeah, go on. Thanks, Ryan. Sorry. No worries. Uh, this isn't a specific uh, project or topic, but it, it kind of relates to all of it again. I, and I'm not a teacher, and I'm just a uni student really at the moment. But um, I was the head of my e committee at school, which was only sixth form based. It was only one one year that was represented, but. And it didn't have this whole process, but it was still, we had so many ideas and so much enthusiasm at the beginning of the year. And by the end, we had been, been able to achieve absolutely nothing because we kept being met with just, no, sorry, we can't do that, can't do that. Um, and so I'm wondering, and it goes back to that power, power dynamics in schools and, and how you say that usually you'd have um, young people facilitating this and, and being the leads in a session like this. And that what we're trying to do at the University of Manchester and Students' Union is trying to create more democratic education spaces. spaces and, and perhaps there's something to do with, I don't know, education for teachers and, and, and um, admin staff and stuff. But um, and sort of carbon literacy in that, but that uh, without addressing that in school, I don't know how you, yeah, that's that. I just wanted to bring that up as, as well. And that's why the teacher drive to, to get this back in the curriculum, to get um, schools really thinking about, you know, climate change is so, so important. I mean, for those of us that have been around for a while, we may remember sustainable schools where there was an imperative for all schools to be sustainable by 2020. Oh, look, we're here. That's, oh, no, we've even passed it. How magical is that? Um, which was very encouraging. And we were doing like whole school training on these issues um, because it was there as something that schools needed to do. And, you know, there have been 10 years of kind of unraveling. And I think that the climate strikes have just woken school leaders up again to the fact that, oh, yeah, we, we, we dropped the ball. What do we do now? So, I mean, I, I think that whole thing of putting pressure on government to, you know, put sustainability back into schools is vital. I don't know whether anyone else wants to comment on that. I would only add that uh, what Ryan you're talking about in terms of relationships in schools and power in schools, um, it, it really chimed with me when when uh, um, Lydia said something today. She said uh, we need to find ways to help teachers to unlock the uh, the the twenty first century vision that young people have, 
and, and, and really you're talking about a different set of relationships than we see in most schools at the moment between, between teachers and pupils and between the hierarchy in the school and the, and the teachers even. Um, so it is, we're, we're starting to do a project, Rachel and I have done a, one interview at least. Rachel, you've done some others I know with, with uh, senior leaders in schools to try and tease this out from their perspective. And, and it's, you know, it's limiting because they've got their frameworks and their understandings of how things are. I don't want to talk too much, but it, I think those relationships issues are very, very important. But we are finding out interesting gaps in in sort of school leaders' knowledge, for example. You know, what is a zero carbon school? What does it look like? In fact, what even makes up the carbon footprint of a school? You know, for a lot of senior leaders, that's kind of something that they haven't even thought about. Uh, so finding ways of just helping people down this route is important. Um, and that's where I think, oh, Jenna, yes, please. Yeah, I was just going to ask, because, you know, obviously the great work that you, that you do through Mean Rachel and that frustration that you must have at the withdrawal of your funding and so on and the MCC situation. Um, a really practical sort of question. How can, can we support Mean? to actually get really on the agenda with MCC, you know? So what are the things that we can do to, to you know, as kind of academics and, and educators and artists and so on to really support the work that you're doing in terms of mean um, and where that resource has been cut and so on? I mean, to be, to be honest, mean is like a small part of a much bigger jigsaw. I mean, we are tiny. Uh, our engagement with the university has been fantastic and really helpful. Um, and we have often used the university as a resource. So, for example, we've used the student union to get young people there talking to students, running climate classrooms. Uh, they've also done climate classroom in the museum. They've had uh, workshops for wildlife in the museum where these young people are just talking to the public which you know really does generate such confidence in young people and then of course Andy brilliantly um, allowed uh, a group of students to come along to talk to the trainee teachers which obviously had an impact and made them have to, you know had a huge impact on young people's confidence uh, but also, I think it's it's obviously had left its mark on MIE as well. Um, so really, it's about providing as many opportunities for young people to do this work. Um, I mean, it was actually Abraham Moss many, many years ago um, that kind of helped start this process. Uh, the eco team in those days, we were it was probably about 2011, 10, something like that. And the eco team worked with a primary school and they did teaching around climate change. And then they went to the Arndale Centre and they just, you know, talked to anybody who was willing to talk to them about climate change to try and get these conversations started. So any opportunities like that are just brilliant. And if you come across any of those opportunities, let us know. Um, yes, Andrea. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, somebody's just sent me an email about the Royal Geographical Society because they're offering a thousand pound grants for innovative geography teaching linking a uh, university with, with a higher education institution with a school. So I kind of ignored it because I couldn't think of a project, but I'm now thinking actually these projects will be great um to do that with um so anyway just everybody know that it's the royal geographical association so yeah and and actually sort of building that capacity of the eco team do you run the eco team andrea no i don't i've not been like i teach history and geography so i've like been concentrating on history recently but i'm thinking we have an amazing ground which is actually an ICI chemical dump where the school's built on top of it, don't even go there, yeah. But it's like a wild area and we never use it because we never go there. And it's like, we've got a forest attached to the school that is not used at all. So I've, I want to start that out. If you, if you want to get that ground tested, um, the Save Our Soils project, we've, oh, we've okay. worked with different schools testing their soil and getting um, the eco team to engage and learn about the history of the site, 
looking so at really it. Not soil. It's like so it was a hill, and they dumped that. So that entire triangle is the waste, and it's got a, a membrane on top of it. So there's like a little bit of soil on top of that, but you can't puncture the membrane. That's where they'll probably die with three heads or terrible diseases and things like that. Yeah, so. but there's still ways of examining it as you know, as a historical project, linking it to soil because obviously soil is. Um, one of, well, it, I find it interesting actually with Kevin this morning because he said, you know, I'm not talking about soil and yet soil is the mm. biggest um, carbon sink on the planet, you know, compare, compared to the oceans or to um, the atmosphere, soil is it, you know, it really, and regenerative processes around soil are so important. So there's a huge amount of learning that can be done with soil in relation to climate change, um, which is very exciting. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to need to do my thing as a host. I think I'm called a host to this session uh, and, and draw it to a close now. Um, I, I hope that's OK. There's a, a minor space here for any last comments that people want to make or put things in the chat and, and say. Um, for me, it's been a really lovely uh, kind of gentle conversation about lots of different uh, examples and possibilities. And uh, I'm really grateful to you, Rachel, for just kind of changing the speed slightly and giving us more chance to just reflect on, on some of the things that are already going on and, and can, be, can be going on. I think it's been really, really positive. And there's links, obviously, to the various websites and, and connection networks that you've talked about 